this point, expansions are an Assassin's Creed staple. Some are so expansive, so good, that they eclipse the games that they belong to, and others, arguably, are the inverse. Blemishes on otherwise well-liked games. And since this series has such an interesting history with the LC, I thought I'd rank all 16 mainline expansions. And it should go without saying that this is the personal opinion of another moron with a microphone. And that's exactly how you're gonna have to treat it, because there are some oddball placements in here that you're just gonna have to hear me out on. Anyway, enough preamble, here's the list. The Dawn of Ragnarok is a groundbreaking expansion in a few ways. It was the first to be excluded from a season pass in this series, the first expansion I've ever played to boast a $40 price point, and this was also the first use of the Ubisoft original branding in this series, which would be endearing were it not for the hefty price of admission. The reason this is way back here is because this expansion is almost completely unremarkable. The next few spots on this list are also pretty rough, but at least there's stuff to laugh at, to be mad about, talk about. There's something to salvage there, as opposed to this emotionless list of tasks that is probably best played catching up on podcasts or something, if you are going to play it, that is. Despite being the most audaciously priced expansion in the series, it is the least additive. I can wail on Odyssey's expansions all day, and I will in five minutes' time, but at least with those there was an attempt to meaningfully expand, which in my eyes is what an expansion should do, very broadly speaking. Valhalla's DLCs are meant to be playable at pretty much any point after arriving in England, and so none of them can have a lasting effect on the main game's characters, or world. Eivor can't experience any significant change, and so this, like Valhalla's other two expansions, is insular. It's a completely detached story with Harvey, not Eivor's Odin, or Odin's Eivor, however you want to phrase it, just representation of what Odin did in his lifetime, because they can't touch that stuff. And I don't think an expansion needs to play directly into the main story and the protagonist, but it has to expand on something, which is possible even under such strange circumstances. Freedom Cry, although it takes place after Black Flag, following a different character, it's able to do this. It adds depth to a central character in the main game, recontextualizing some important scenes through a story that gives way for new takes on old gameplay. It's singular, sure, but you can't deny that it's expansive to that main game in ways that Dawn of Ragnarok simply isn't. The main story can't really be expanded upon directly, nor is there any attempt to recontextualize anything, but in terms of mechanics, there is one real addition which is the Huger, this power wheel. You can harness ice, fire, flight, and rebirth, which basically allows you to resurrect enemies as allies. You know me, I don't enjoy fantastical stuff in these games, and I'll avoid it where possible, but some of this stuff does have a use, and on one occasion it is even integrated into this story, which is something that I always like. Most of the time though, Huger isn't used interestingly. It's typically the means to bypass the same boring roadblocks, although it is something in the way of an addition, and I do want to be fair. To go back to story, because I guess that's worth looking at as its own thing, it's not good. There isn't a beginning nor end to it, and I'm not saying that as some snarky riddle. Dawn of Ragnarok is the middle 70% of a story. You dropped into this quest to find your captured son, Balder, mid-dialogue, well after Javi's discovered that he's been kidnapped. And this wouldn't be so bad if maybe there were some flashbacks to flesh out Balder and his relationship with Javi, or maybe if Javi's relationship with Balder's mother is explored. This woman you're expected to care about when she dies five minutes in. You as a player are never really given reason to emotionally invest in the main quest of the expansion. It's never properly established established and Javi isn't sympathetic in the least. It's amateurishly sloppy and points to a story cut short. I really do think that this expansion was released purely to capitalize on the AC brand in a year when no big content was lined up. And so I speculate that this was kind of spun up, reusing and repurposing lots of existing assets without pulling too many resources and heads from the many many projects Ubisoft are currently developing. I do feel like cash grab is a term often applied to stuff that is just bad, but this is a case where it genuinely applies, and that is most blatant in the story, which just ends after you kill the final boss. You kill a big fire thing for what feels like the hundredth time, and that's it. The credits roll after this, I'm serious. If this doesn't seem stupid to you, let me demonstrate just how insanely unsatisfying this is.
The lack of any falling action or even attempt at conclusion is detrimental to this and any story. Without meaningful resolution, a story feels like a series of only somewhat connective ideas and events with no relation, no point, no complete unifying body. It's almost like if there was a point to this, it wasn't to craft a satisfying narrative, but to... Oh. Although there was one moment where I found myself becoming kind of interested in the story. Harvey finds out that his son is dead and is ready to just give up and die in his single really human moment in this expansion that's visually interesting too. And then a character he had a rushed, sparkless relationship with is killed and he reverts to being really mad again. Just the same person he was for the entire DLC, and that's depicted as a good thing, this moment of triumph. And that flicker of humanity is never addressed or alleviated at all, because, again, the expansion simply doesn't conclude. It all just feels so sloppy. Like, at the beginning of each chapter, there's these quote screens that pop up that had no reason not to be seen, and they just don't fade away or into cutscene. You have to skip them like cutscenes or else they play indefinitely. Even getting past a clumsy story and a lack of polish, there isn't really anything to pick up that slack. The world and quest design are so boring, there's nothing to do. It's just caves and bandit camps, there are no areas of density and traversal is not even an afterthought. Here's a viewpoint it took over two minutes to climb with no interesting obstacles or alternative routes. You're just kind of dropped into this big, empty, vertical world and are immediately tasked with finding shelters and gathering silica. It's not even the worst of Valhalla, it's much worse than that. It's the very most banal of Odyssey. This branding of the most ambitious expansion in AC history is frankly insane. An expansion that is not just the most ambitious, supposedly, but also the most expensive in this series should justify that boldness. With polish, cohesion, and genuinely meaningful expansion in story and gameplay, all are absent here. In fact, as far as ambition goes, 14 of the 15 other expansions on this list have it beat. This is meant to be a representation of some of the events preceding the Toba catastrophe, but this filter of Norse mythology is so thick that it's a nightmare figuring out what translates to what. I wouldn't mind vagueness and use of analogy if this fantastical metaphor felt like actual metaphor with intention. Instead, it feels like the sole focus of the expansion, justified later with reference and comparison to Isu things we know. It just feels like cheap bait for God of War fans, the current popular thing. And with a completely empty, boring map and two-thirds of a story that lays out several inconsistencies with the main game, Ragnarok ends up feeling like an unfinished product, which for the price tag is not ideal. This is the worst Assassin's Creed DLC, and I hope, for the good of this franchise, that it stays that way. Fate of Atlantis is a mess. This DLC is the connective tissue between the end of Cassandra or Mystios, I recorded this on an Alexios playthrough, so we'll just say Mystios for the sake of visual consistency. Anyway, it connects the end of their story in the main game of Odyssey and the end of the present day, where Layla is given the Staff of Hermes to send her off to be the heir of memories. It's Aletheia teaching Mystios how to wield the Staff, holding her consciousness so that she can get it to Layla. Now, the way that she teaches Mystios to wield the Staff is by creating simulations, a premise that is taken to the most bizarre yet boring of places. To impart learning on Mystios, Aletheia has them ticking boxes in bandit camps and politicking with transparent, manipulative leaders, which surely isn't a learning experience to a person who at this point has to be a Bobby Fisher level talent at doing exactly those things. This whole framing device of a simulation built to teach just makes Odysseys tiring repetitive game design even more conspicuous, when not only is it devoid of fun, or certainly novelty, but you can't even reverse engineer some kind of purpose to this laundry list of tasks as you can in other expansions. It's largely what you've come to expect from Odyssey, killing nameless leaders, destroying supplies, and once again the fantasy is sacrificed for the formula. I can see this otherwise very pretty world for exactly what it is, a space that serves as 
nothing more than a vacuous zone built for busy work. The same of course going for every character and questline. And the fact that this is simulation consistently undercuts the desired weight of this story. We and Mystios are told time and time again that the events that we're seeing aren't real, yet they're conveyed as if they are. Leonidas and Phoebe returned, and they are treated with complete seriousness. It's not like Mystios is just kind of taken aback or reminded of a tragic past. They seemingly completely believe this. The weight of the simulation is given and taken at the writer's convenience, and the player's inconvenience. There's a lack of consistency here that never ceases to frustrate. It's virtually impossible to get and keep your bearings. It's very clearly just a contrived reason to play with Greek mythology, and like the implementation of a lot of mythology in this sort of trilogy, the Isu were used as a justification, demystifying them and telling their stories with this aesthetic that is incredibly far removed from their core appeal. It's all to make these events more digestible to Mystios. Aletheia has kind of translated these Isu into Greek gods and myths, which is the focus here. But unfortunately, even that isn't consistent. For example, Minerva is referred to as Minerva, which was just one of several names that she had that she gave to Ezio and by extension us as players because Minerva is the Italian or the Roman interpretation of her. Now her direct Greek equivalent is Athena. This was confirmed in The Last Descendants over a year before this DLC was released. Once again, Mystios is just a player avatar, with none of the benefits that come with that style of protagonist. This inconsistency doesn't matter to them because well, nothing does. They accept the bizarreness of all of this with a sociopathic nonchalance. It's really sloppy, and the integrity of the Isu comes second to all of the other bullshit. This really foundational, central lore is managed with so little care and without any of the attention to detail or the respect of rules that used to make Assassin's Creed feel almost plausible, and the universe so rich. The sixth sense, the Isu ability to perceive time and possibilities, is made into something that can be studied and learned by, ostensibly, a human. And this isn't explored whatsoever, it's just an excuse to incorporate another collectible to pad out an already mercilessly long expansion, which pretty much summarizes why I don't like the handling of any of the Isu stuff here. You have this really interesting concept in a mostly human hybrid learning to use the sixth sense, sort of like what was planned with Desmond. And instead of exploring that, it's a mere justification for yet another soul-crushing checklist. Aletheia's entire manufactured series of events is never explored either. It's a surface-level excuse to have you go do epic shit with this flashy coat of paint. This manufactured history is never held to scrutiny or even questioned. Maybe Aletheia would sway history her way and we'd see some biases in play, but she has no reason to even depict this history nor attempt to manipulate Mystios or Layla because they are completely on board from the get-go, way too on board. Mystios has complete trust in Aletheia that this is worth his time and that he isn't being fucked over for absolutely no reason. Conceptually, I love the ancestor being a conduit and connecting Isu to ancestor to descendant. But when that central link has no personal investment or expressed understanding or misunderstanding of the weight of this role or conflict around it, just apathy, it doesn't work. Ezio's role as a messenger was so fantastic because while he never really has complete clarity, it lingers with him for decades. There's a sense of duty he has in being prophet that burdens him and pushes him ever forward well into his twilight years, and it contributes to the greatest payoff in any game I've ever played. Whereas Cassandra, Alexios, they aren't characters, they're without defined characteristics. This conduit role is without any real weight. This concept is the only thing that I really like about the DLC, and it never had a chance of working. Even if you make Mystios a character, the more, I guess, experimental ideas are held back by Odyssey's very nature. The game can't even convey a one-on-one -on -one conversation convincingly. For example, there's this one scene that conceptually I really like that suffers considerably for its animation. It's an air of memories, when Layla's reliving the memories of Deimos while suffering from the bleeding effect as Mystios. She's now torturing a person that the latter saw as an ally and is struggling to stay synchronized because she too renders this person as an ally. On paper, this was the strongest the modern day had been in a good while, but then it looks like this and is written and performed 
very awkwardly. It's also just dropped as soon as it happens. I take issue with a lot of Odyssey's dialogue animations, but the fact that they're applied to Alethea in a simulation of the real her as she moves her hands around in the same way a merchant or pirate or any NPC would, it really doesn't help this problem of the Isu being completely detached from what we understand the Isu to be. There's no eccentricity or uncanniness they are well and truly demystified in this expansion. Even the dialogue just sucks. Everyone's swearing all the time. Like, it's it's lame in the main game, sure, but it's ramped up here to Shadow the Hedgehog teenage fanfiction levels. I didn't bow to your wife, and I won't bow to you. <laughs> oh, you fucking bow. When every character is doing this, or philosophizing like a 14 year old who's made the unfortunate mistake of, of stumbling upon r slash stoicism, you have to laugh at it. If you're gonna play it, you can't take it seriously. I'd, I'd been awake for two days playing this, and by the end, I was just fucking slumped in my chair, giggling like a moron, and it was almost fun. But I do want to discuss some of the more decent stuff in this expansion. It's not at the very bottom for a reason, and to say that it's all terrible would be uncharitable. Some efforts are made to make these realms feel like a part of this unreal simulation, like the now almost dreamlike jingle when you activate a viewpoint, I think that's neat. I like that combat has a bit of a different surreal dynamic with this stone archetype that targets adrenaline, basically forcing you to be more conservative. Although by the end game of Fate, you're given so many skill points you can kind of abuse them and that power dynamic levels back out. Which is, like, so annoying, having power withheld from you constantly to inflate the game's runtime, and then having it gifted to you in excess when you don't really need it anymore and it's to the game's detriment. As I touched on earlier, the three realms in this expansion are rather pretty, or two of them are, and that's not to say that I hold it against the underworld for not being a holiday destination. Each world feels very distinct and aesthetic, and they all have their own viewpoint jingles. The one in Elysium specifically is quite nice. My issues with the world are in verticality and substance, and unfortunately the lack of the latter completely eclipses whatever beauty there is. In terms of verticality, the structures in each realm are so tall and smooth that these teleport pads are introduced, which is such a boring way of navigating a single space. Necessitating a rope launcher was bad, sure, but literal teleportation around one space or structure speaks to a complete disregard for interesting movement, in a series where interesting movement is absolutely paramount. In terms of substance, there's not really any. Replaying all of these expansions for this video, I wanted to get the full breadth of each, and to give each of them their fair shake, even those I don't really enjoy playing, and I can safely say that there is nothing here. The vast majority of significant locations or landmarks are directly tied to the story, and there's nothing to really discover yourself. By the time you complete the main story, you don't feel this push to go out into the world and discover, which I feel is very important for an RPG, and Fate continues to fail at being the kind of RPG that Odyssey was trying to be, one of complete agency. Once again, you have none. This became blatantly clear in the first episode set in Elysium. The big artificial choice here is between Adonis's rebellion and the reign of Persephone. The thing is, you're required to do quests for both parties, where you basically fuck with the other. It's obvious you're playing both sides, and there's never a point where there's any conflict over this, or a cutting off of one of those quest lines, because if there's anything Odyssey needed, it was more content. In all of my choices, I tried to make it abundantly clear that I was sympathetic to the Rebellion, and was as insulting as it was possible to be to Hermes, and he didn't care. He patiently waited until the third act bell rang to begin being upset with me. This approach to choice makes not only Mystios' lack of character and your lack of genuine agency more apparent, it makes these characters and their conflict feel completely contrived and insincere. This is choice at its very most benign and ruinous. The modern day of this DLC, because this DLC does have a modern day, is bad. The worst the modern day has ever been, and it has been very bad. I don't know how I'm expected to sympathise with Layla when 
Not only is she unlikable at every turn, but uncharacteristically stupid to the convenience of a bad plot. Layla is established as a character who is very well-versed. She's always rattling off facts about whatever mission is at hand. And here it's effectively retcon that she knows anything about the Isu, Pieces of Eden, or basic human communication, as she is repeatedly manipulated by an Isu. Like, that is their signature fucking move, man. That is that is their only move. And still, Layla just does her bidding without really considering ulterior motive. It's all so contrived. Like, Layla's conflict with Victoria escalates so inorganically. There's this scene where Victoria scolds Layla for killing an Abstergo death squad, who moments ago were doing their job as a death squad. And literally a minute later, they're talking like Marvel characters. Ugh, I'll never get used to that. She comes out of nowhere. Glad you're back. Bet even you didn't see that Abstergo ambush coming, Alethea. Not exactly. But as long as they're gone and you're ready, your journey with the stuff continues. After that cliffhanger in the pit of Elysium, you bet I'm ready. <laughs> I have to see what happens next. Just constantly undermining the weight of these very grave events. Even Otto Berg is made completely gullible as his new fat Greek head makes its first and final appearance. And this is truly a fine addition to the Berg pantheon that we've got going on. Playing this just made me incredibly sad that we never saw Anglo Berg in AC Valhalla, because that's the, that's the coolest, funniest one. Just 40% body fat, nicotine stained teeth, and Norwood 4 on the balding scale. I really dislike how even Otto Berg isn't immune to this mass dumbing down, this master strategist, this unbelievable fighter, takes on Layla with a stick and, and gets leveled while spouting some of the most typical villain dialogue conceivable. Everything is just kind of uncanny. It's almost like peering into an alternate universe where the icons and the staples of AC remain, but the original vision for this series was fundamentally different. The bleeding effect is warped into something inconsistent with its past and current self, there's choices not just in the animus, but in the modern day for some reason. The Isu lack any sense of heightened intellect or eccentricity, they're very dull. Fate of Atlantis does kind of seal Odyssey as a worst case scenario Assassin's Creed, and for that, I hold it in a fairly poor regard. Legacy of the First Blade is a rough one. Its very concept is pretty shaky. The expansion sees Mystios meeting the legendary Darius, who was introduced in Assassin's Creed 2. He's one of the six legendary assassins of such caliber and importance to the Brotherhood that his statue stands beside Altair's in the sanctuary. Darius was the first recorded user of the Hidden Blade, using it to kill the Persian king Xerxes. He was an imperative part of the Brotherhood's mythos until 2017, when he and half of these people suddenly weren't, because the Hidden Ones were founded more than 50% of the way through recorded history. These are now proto-assassins. The creed's rituals, their ideology, it all originates from Bayek and Aya, who have no connection to Eltani, Wei Yu, or Darius, discounting what is basically lip service. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's not fine, but fine. So what is the right way to deal with Darius? Do you retcon the retcon, making for a completely lateral move? Or do you accept that Darius can't really be an assassin without devaluing the origins of the actual brotherhood? Legacy doesn't exactly do either, because Darius, in a fair few ways, is an assassin. A cloaked, stealthy man who uses a hidden blade to ensure freedom with his covert group of freedom fighters. They also have a hidden bureau, by the way, and it's difficult to argue that he's just a proto-assassin when, on top of all of that, he's doing the leap of faith. Something that has always had serious meaning, but was made deeply personal to Bayek the game before. So not only is the establishment of the Hidden Ones made emptier when they basically already existed, but their foundation is made less personal, because the leap of faith is no longer this unique family tradition that Bayek wanted to pass on to his son, it's just a jump, apparently. This situation isn't good. As you can probably tell from the rather passive-aggressive opening of this segment, 
I dislike the foundation of the Hidden Ones on a number of levels. I think that it's bad enough that it ripples and hurts several other games, succeeding it and eventually preceding it, if you choose to take it into account. And the retconning of the proto-assassins is arguably its worst offence. It's this choice that invalidates some of the earliest most important Assassin's Creed lore told to us, because Darius, Wei-Yu, and Iltani are irrelevant to the formation of the Hidden Ones. Bayek uses Darius's hidden blade without really questioning who or where it came from, and their traditions and ideals are established independently. Now, I really like the idea of proto-assassins and Templars. The series is better for their introduction in Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, but solidifying these characters as being central to the series' mythos in not just games, but objective encyclopedias, and then just retconning them into redundancy years later, it's the kind of attitude towards lore and narrative consistency that feels like it punishes long-term investment instead of rewarding it. It's one of my least favourite creative decisions in this series, so Darius being ostensibly an assassin is a bad thing, it devalued the then new origins of the Brotherhood, but it absolutely shouldn't be a bad thing. I dislike the framework that makes that so, but I also dislike how he's used and wasted in this expansion independent from Origins. The entirety of Legacy feels like a clumsy attempt to make Odyssey more significant by connecting it to Origins, most awkwardly with the reveal that Aya is a descendant of Cassandra, an idea that fails itself at its very conception that is executed very, very poorly. This is something that could never work, because for Odyssey to truly prioritise choice as advertised and repeatedly told to you in-game, the player would have a say in decisions as significant as marriage and parenthood. If you wanted your Mystios not to have relationships, or if you wanted them to be gay, or if you weren't swooning for Greek NPC 107, you would find your supposed agency violated yet again. This expansion evidences just how impractical Odyssey's one foot in, one foot out approach to choice is. Any attempt to make the protagonist more than an apathetic avatar means that narrative just collapses in on itself, and boy, does this thing collapse? Like it or not, Mystheos forms a relationship with Darius's child, Nakates, who, in a world of warriors, scholars, and degenerates, feels like a, a bafflingly boring choice, and there's just no chemistry there anyway. The child Cassandra has with Nakates is, as it turns out, an ancestor of Aya. An insane choice that serves no purpose beyond senseless fan service that doesn't even track. The Apple has no reaction to Aya, despite her having what would be a high concentration of Isu DNA. It's one of those Disney Universe style connections that makes this expansive world feel smaller as opposed to deeper. Because this revelation means that Aya is a descendant of not just Cassandra, but Darius, Pythagoras, and Leonidas. And I would be happy to give a coincidence like that some slack if it actually served the narrative, but neither of these characters benefit from this link. If the point was that Cassandra did indeed further the bloodline, don't use a character who apparently doesn't have a significant amount of fursive DNA. Any time that I play Origins, this completely slips my mind, because it doesn't recontextualize this story or character in any meaningful way. Like, what was the point of this? It's not like I inherited the blade, Cleopatra just had it. The name Legacy of the First Blade would suggest that the expansion is, at least in part, about the blade, which is given no backstory or new lore. Darius just has it because, well, he's Darius, he's supposed to. Despite featuring a lot of Assassin's Creed things and people, Legacy doesn't expand or add to anything, really. No amount of flubbed iconography is going to give this story a point. In fact, Mystio seemingly just forgets any of this happened, like the second the credits roll. I don't think it's ever as insane or confusing as Fate of Atlantis, but the writing here is seriously some of the least engaging in this series. There's not a believable relationship in the entire DLC. In place of character building, everyone speaks in cliché and platitudes. Similarly to Las Maharaja, every character is animated so strangely that even if the dialogue did feel human, a character's general expression would telegraph something completely alien. <laughs> <gasps> you! What are you doing here? There's so much I want to say, so many things. 
Please! <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a whole lot more to say on this one because it does share a lot of Atlantis's issues that I covered fairly extensively, but in any case, I'd place Legacy of the First Blade near to the bottom. This sounds mean, but The Last Maharaja is the single most unremarkable piece of Assassin's Creed content. Sure, Odyssey's DLCs are a swing and a miss. In this case, the batter got too fucked up the night before the game and slept through the innings. This is brutally skippable. There is, there is never even a moment that Maharaja really tries to hook you into its story, which is a half-assed conflict existing only to repackage a bunch of missions you've already played for a few dollars more. And I really do mean that. This is Assassin's Creed Syndicate greatest hits, with the dull carriage chase, the train defense, the ambush, and the... I'm, I'm being a dickhead, but I'm right. The expansion starts with us meeting Julep Singh, where we get some of the most stilted dialogue and animations this series has to offer. I mean, look at this. Come, Thomas. This isn't enough of a challenge. Let's shorten the timer. But I could not resist the chance of seeing you again. It's been far too long. I've heard nobody throws a party better than my dearest friend. <laughs> Are you suggesting this is a serious matter? It was most likely just an echo. Leave it be now. You're still here? About that second shot. I don't know that there's a single exchange in here that doesn't feel completely inorganic, which doesn't help when Singh is enlisting you on a mission you already have no reason to care about. The entire thing is about Singh's displacement as India's Maharaja, but the expansion does absolutely nothing to make you care about Jaleep or the fate of India. This entire story is without stakes. A good example of how to make a player care about a story like this is the Patsy Conspiracy, which holds weight because time is spent establishing Florence as Ezio's home. It's warm and the music is quaint, it feels homely, it's important to him and by extension, us. Early on in the game, we see Lorenzo standing up for Florence against Uberto. He is a much favorable alternative to the scheming Templars. By the time of his assassination attempt, stakes have been established. Florence will suffer at the hands of the Patsy, who are very personal enemies, and so I feel encouraged to thwart this assassination and to save my city. Ezio and Lorenzo share some really great moments and I want to help him. This is an arc with motivation and gravity, and none of that is understood or attempted by Maharaja, which just lazily thrust you in the direction of two hours of regurgitated slop. I'm sorry, but I feel bored even talking about it. You know, for the first half of this DLC, I assumed you could play these missions as Jacob or Evie, purely because none of the dialogue being spoken at me was at all personal. All of it was expositional or instructional, with zero subtext or emotion. I was at a complete loss starting a memory that forced me to be Jacob, because I just spent a lot of time with Henry as Evie. These two characters have a supposed romantic interest in the other, yet the dialogue was so flat and impersonal, I genuinely believed I could have been playing as her brother. It's astounding that a two hour DLC somehow drags this much, because Maharaja is tiny, and somehow Quebec still managed to underdeliver with such divining competence that I almost admire the existence of a product so impossibly lifeless. I don't know how you make a mere two hours of content so boring, or, or I will once this sleep deprived rambling session is, is wrapped up and out the door. This is maybe the driest 120 minutes I've spent in a futile attempt to have fun, the, the meaning of which I have since forgotten. Even challenge, basic resistance is something you're deprived of, with the excessively long timers, the charitable ally health bars, and the fast and furious slow-mo that gives you a safety margin fit for an infant. I know that because I, an infant, flubbed this shot twice somehow and wasn't punished for it. And I think that the real joy of Last Maharaja does come from that awkwardness. Here's a, a few favorites of mine. Good. Thief. May this not be the end of our adventures together. No, let's not end this partnership just yet. We can only move forward from here. Good day. It's not here. Oh. 
The story itself wraps up so prematurely and inconclusively, I open my map afterwards to check for the next mission. Julie just kind of discontinues service with the assassins and gives a brief, hollow speech about India, its leadership, and himself. Worthless, when none of those three are prescribed meaning to the player, when that's the first thing the story should have done. We're missing all of the context and characterization that makes something like the Patsy conspiracy compelling. Even Jacob is just not there while this is happening, and for once, I empathize with this character. You might be left wondering why this isn't at the very bottom, as I've had nothing good to say about it, unlike Dawn of Ragnarok or some of the concepts in Fate. This is here not by virtue of quality, but by virtue of being much less offensive in its poor quality. It's, it's never hitting Fate levels of inadequacy. And maybe that's an indictment in itself, that it's so mundane it deprives itself of the possibility of being memorably bad, which in some way, might make it the worst. Anyway, the <laughs> that's enough like gamer philosophy. You know a thing is dull when instead of talking about it, you'd sooner philosophize around it. it. It's rough. It's the one that I find to be characterized by boredom the very most, which is the very worst thing to associate with a bad product. Disengagement. Maharaja almost gives me a sense of begrudging respect for Odyssey's DLCs, which, while having huge stretches of monotony, will sometimes have me screaming or laughing psychotically at my monitor, depending on which stage of the grieving process I'm in. But yeah, you get the idea. To be totally transparent, I was never really expecting a lot of Valhalla's first DLC. What I hoped for, going into this, was basically just one of the better arcs from Valhalla's main game, with enough substance and uniqueness to justify existing as its own thing. And in some ways that is what this is, and in other frustrating ways that's what this isn't. If there's one thing that Valhalla needed, that Avor needed, it wasn't yet another arc centred around doing murderous odd jobs for another king, only without Odin or any kind of character growth. There is nothing here that adds to Avor's character or the overarching story. No modern day development, no interesting spin on any gameplay system in the main game, or anything. It's a DLC that's safe to the point of boredom. Because say what you like about Tyranny of King Washington, or Lost Archive, if that's not your thing, at least those expansions did something a little audacious and different in regard to story and play to justify their respective price tags. Even this story doesn't feel new. You're going back through the same motions you were so many times in the main game, to the point where these characters don't feel like characters, but recurring archetypes. The would-be leader, the transparent turncoat, and the old comrade who serves as nothing more than a shaky motive to justify the arc's existence. There's multiple story beats that had me feeling deja vu. From the minute Kira mentions that she was a druid, you know exactly where the story's going and how it's going to end. If you fed an AI the main game and asked it for another arc, this is what it would spit back out at you. I like plenty of the arcs from the main game, in fact I really like a few of them, but even the weaker ones, the arcs that are often written off as filler, for the most part felt as if they had some thematic significance, contributing at least moderately to Eivor's ongoing internal conflict. At the very worst, there was usually still a discernible point, but when this side story exists almost outside of time with nothing to say about the characters or the world, it just feels tiring. There's nothing to push me through that fatigue. I tried, I really did try to get immersed and to enjoy this new story for what it is, but this story very quickly begins to feel like a mere framework to take you from bandit camp to bandit camp. I really couldn't grasp any investment in it. Eivor's main goal in this expansion is to secure Ireland under Flan Shinna's rule, in order to secure trade with the country. And because of the way this game is structured, you're not gonna see that difference in gameplay or story, because again, you're able to play the arc at almost any time. It doesn't matter whether you have that trade relationship or not. And the king that you intend to empower truly could be anybody. It's never explained what he believes in, if his rule would be better or worse for the people that he would rule over. And the other kings that you win over, bar two, aren't given names or faces, let alone any distinct motive or reason for working 
or not working with Flanchina. They are just a reason to throw filler at you, you clear bandit camps or steal nondescript jewels for them. You need to complete six of these at a minimum if you want to complete the expansion. It's a shame that for the last few years, DLCs have seemingly been built around a very rigid structure in which the story comes last. And this story specifically suffers for that, for all of these detours that serve no purpose, that only exist to pad this thing out. In the main game, there's a few arcs that suffer for being condensed into these relatively relatively short stories. Certain plot points end up feeling as if they've been rushed to their conclusions, or maybe a key character's motivations end up feeling underdeveloped. And here, I really did expect the largest scale to aid the story, to forego those issues. But instead of spending extra time developing these characters, and these groups, and building investment, you're just thrown quest after quest of the same unmotivated, filler content. Any investment just kind of hemorrhages as more and more time is spent doing just bullshit. You become so bored and detached that in a moment like the death of Barith, you don't feel the intended gut punch. You can't feel it, because you've been spending so much time stealing nondescript jewels from nondescript bandits, instead of giving us more of Barith, or more of Sigthrith, so that his eventual coronation as King of Dublin means something more. In terms of other narrative goings on, there's obviously the climax where Kira uses the Leah Fall, which has sort of similar effects to the Apple. It controls minds, and in gameplay there's those weird AoE attacks. My problem with the Leah Fall isn't a logistic one, it's that it's just sort of this shameless excuse for an epic boss battle. An older game, or fuck it, this one, would question why it was there who built it, and why it can only be used by the women of Kira's bloodline. The DLC establishes a series of questions that I did have interest in, that aren't answered, nor even touched upon. Because I don't need answers, but it would be much better for unique AC lore to be prioritised and thoughtfully integrated into the story. Here it serves as a loose rationalisation of yet another boss fight. In terms of some things that I did like, because this is far from being the worst DLC, I thought the trading system was okay. I am a big fan of those sorts of micromanagement elements in AC, so that was cool, although I do wish it was a bit more grounded in the world and story. What made Monterigioni so fantastic was that you could observe and feel the fruits of your labour, and not just visually watching the town grow and become less derelict, but also in a more material way, unlocking the mines and the well for you to explore, or earning discounts from local shops. Whereas with this trading system, everything is concentrated within this menu, with the only real tangible rewards being, I think, two outfits and some tattoos. Even Dublin levelling up its renown is only effective to the trading menu, which makes it feel totally insular and kind of pointless. I think it would have been nice if the system was connected to Ravensthorpe too, that's probably my biggest issue with Wrath of the Druids. There's a total lack of integration with the main game. It doesn't add anything to Eivor's journey, in fact it's completely parallel to it, it doesn't recontextualise anything from any of the main arcs. I realise that you can't reference certain events without throwing Ubisoft's whole insistence on, you know, weird pseudo non-linearity out of whack, but adhering to it so rigidly deprives this DLC of any narrative purpose. The final product just feels like a bit of a waste of time that is often regressive of the main game. You no longer have Stranger Events, which while kind of flawed, did add this element of the unexpected that steered away from formula, and really it's formula that this expansion is burdened with. You don't have Confessions anymore, which really sucks because they're very good in Valhalla. The Zealots are basically a tertiary background part of the order that could have just been a bunch of soulless red shirts meant to make a long list longer. But their confessions don't just serve to make them a bit more individual, it also fleshes out the order in this particular era, which makes them so much more than just a list of bosses. I would say that the zealots and their confessions strengthen Alfred's final cutscene, or penultimate cutscene, and also his last two letters. So then when you take confessions away from the druids, None of them, besides those two that actually are characters, feel unique, and you also miss out on the chance to expand on the group, something that was desperately needed to make them feel less shallow and one-dimensional than what they actually ended up being. In terms of other issues, the thing is kinda broken. I got to maybe the fourth quest where you go to the coronation in Meath, 
and Kira simply wouldn't move. No amount of other side quests or closing and reopening the game fixed it, so I had to reload an earlier autosave and get back a, a couple hours of progress. Besides that, you have, you know, the typical jank of invisible walls, NPCs running but not moving, clipping, completely broken detection, getting stuck inside objects, NPCs just refusing to comply. I don't know if all of that still applies because I wrote this the day this thing came out for a review of the DLC that I ended up shelving. The reason I didn't just replay that first arc to get to this on a new save is because I plan at some point relatively soon to revisit Valhalla and to really focus on it. I want to do a video looking back at the game in its entirety now that the final quest is out and I've probably or I know that I have changed my mind considerably on some things, and so I don't really want to mess with that replay by dipping my toe back in, uh, to, to go back to a DLC that I'm fairly sure I'll still feel the same about, for the most part. So I apologise if this particular segment reeks of is Eivor a Templar, triple accented error Walshy. Any strangeness, bad opinions here, that's on him. New AC, new AC YouTuber. Anyway, on to the next one. The tyranny of King Washington, or as it should be, the tyranny of King George, is a strange expansion, especially for its time. The premise of this one is that Washington now has an apple, and we'll get to that. But since then, he's been tormented by these terrible dreams, where he's this brutal, totalitarian American king. So he confides in Connor, who is in these dreams. The two touch the apple, and in a split second, they envisage this alternate reality, that is the basis of this DLC. So the events of Tyranny, at least the main story, do not happen in canon. And I don't actually take issue with this. I think that what-if stories can be an interesting way to delve into a lot of things you couldn't otherwise explore. They can stress the importance of certain events that now don't occur, taking characters to different places entirely, highlighting the things that make them them, and what keeps them together. Ideally, a what-if story is complementary to the text it's based on and the characters in it. Unfortunately, Tyranny doesn't really complement anything. It's quite clear which expansions are led by their stories and which are led by the prospect of new systems and mechanics. This ends up feeling like the latter, to the extent that the story serves no real purpose at all. That's not to say that there isn't a story, there is, it just fails to capitalise on that alternate reality entirely. Where we leave Connor, he is acutely aware that power is corruptive, and generally, he's sceptical of Washington, naturally. So there's no revelation in this for him. Washington, on the other hand, while an incredibly ambitious man by nature of his many positions and policies, there are never the seeds of dictatorship and detachment that we see here. This alternate reality exacerbates traits in Washington that are never really presented to us. This character is otherwise mild-mannered and modest, as he supposedly was in real life. So this story is teaching a lesson to a protagonist who has been beaten over the head with it for his entire life by use of this other character who is so cartoonishly evil and so far removed from his basis that he is practically somebody else. I'm fine with him being somebody else, I mean, especially here, but it needs to play on existing traits that are heightened by the corruption of the Apple, else there's no point in using that character. I can't see anything ever making Washington publicly execute civilians with genuinely evil indifference, and so I'm completely detached from this antagonist and the conflict as a whole. He is so unrecognisable and the story is so silly that none of his genuinely awful transgressions hold weight. Beyond that main concept though, there are so many interesting possibilities to be explored, and one of these that the expansion does explore is the possibility that Zio, Connor's mother, never died. And really disappointingly, nothing of value is done with this. You have this opening scene where Connor is in disbelief that his mother's alive, and that's it, really. Haytham is name-dropped, Connor inherits his hidden blades, and it's all kind of swept aside, even though he remembers everything about his real life, for some reason. And there's one conversation, one abandoned narrative promise with Zio, that is particularly egregious. To fight back against Washington's forces, who are burning villages, the clan leader wants Connor to consume the tea. The tea gifts its drinkers with these insane, physical enhancements. Now, Zio hates the idea of this, and Connor is forbidden from drinking it, as she explains that for all of its great physical benefits, the consequences that it has on the mind are just as great. Doubly so for Connor, who is the son of a violent man. Now, when she dies, 
The very next thing that Connor does is drink the tea. There is one line of stiff apology before doing this, and that's it. There's no inner conflict, nor any of those cautioned effects on his psyche. He is the same before and after betraying his not yet cold mother's memory for this forbidden fruit, only now he has an admittedly sick gang of ghost wolves. Now as a male, I understand that most men would do anything to be a wolf, or god knows any kind of cool primate, or maybe a bobcat, but there needs to be consequences when a huge choice, or what should be a huge choice, is explained to be deeply grave and is forbade several times. This is what I meant when I said this is led by new gameplay opportunities and not story. And honestly, such poor implementation puts this down probably a whole spot or two. It, it's that annoying to me. And this failing of potential, unfortunately, is a consistency, at least in terms of writing, because otherwise, there are some neat twists, namely in world. There's all this propaganda around every corner of an inhospitable world, and you're notorious all the time, so you feel encouraged to stick to the solitude of the rooftops, much like you are in the greatest game of all time. I just wish that the nature of this new world was reflected in colour a little more. It's a new save file entirely, instead of missions set in the normal world, so it would have been nice if there was a recolor fit to this depressing dystopia. That aggressive tint and these four repeating NPC character models really did take me out of that dystopia. I mean, look at this sun-kissed sea of beige here. Truly an inspired choice to have the evil dictator speech take place at fucking Daisy Circuit. And on the topic of colour, they just straight up didn't remaster the fragmented memories, the actual final cutscene, or the recaps. And bear in mind, the scenes in the recaps are already remastered. Uh, but luckily, if, if it really bothers you, you can just remaster them yourself in any editing software. But back on point, the soundtrack, like in the main game, is fantastic. I know that Lorne Balf has really made a name for himself on some huge projects in the last decade, but I really, really hope there's a place for him in Assassin's Creed's big future. He is really great. But with the exception of world and soundtrack, the tyranny of King Washington is a failure of concept in story and in commentary. Huge potential goes wasted on micro and macro scale. This idea of a tyrannical American monarchy, arising just years before its king would have assumed the first American presidency, that has a lot of implications. For one, how would the Assassins and Templars react to this? This could be an opportunity to present some unexpected common ground and to elaborate on the main game's many observations about this conflict and what it says about power and free will and human nature, whether humans are better off controlled and to what extent. The fact that the series' central conflict is ignored in an expansion with such major political ramifications speaks to how little it really belongs in Assassin's Creed. This is the first time that the series really dips its toe into the fantastical. The Pieces of Eden are not fantastical powers. The difference is not just in aesthetic, but explanation or eventual lack thereof. The Pieces of Eden were designed as tools, created by the ones who came before as a part of this series' pseudoscience, and there is a distinct unique aesthetic tied to them, as well as, originally, real, sometimes poetic consequence for the wielders of these tools and weapons that were just as extreme and unpleasant as what its victims experienced. Even if a piece of Eden is used to wave away their existence as Isu magic, this fails itself. These tools were built with purpose and must adhere to their pseudoscience and its trappings. The ones who came before are not magical. Even if these powers and aesthetics have passable in-universe explanations, which a few times they do, they belong here as much as flying cars belong in GTA or children in a Genshin Impact Lobby. I'm saying this here discussing the precedent of fantastical gameplay mechanics so that I don't have to say this over and over this video, because you've probably already heard this talking point a thousand times over, whether from me this scotch degenerate, or the guy who was so mad about these things that it literally broke him. But anyway, they are there, so we may as well discuss them for what they are in Tyranny. Generally, I consider these abilities to discourage expression and creativity more than they provide that. The worst offender here is certainly the bear power, which is an AoE attack that destroys anything within about 10 feet of you, discouraging use of a pretty good combat system in favour of 
mashing the Y button, dashing away to get some health, and then doing it again. And I wouldn't mind this really powerful ability as much were it not so interruptive to the quite enjoyable flow of combat. You basically have to stop everything you're doing to use this, and then the animation plays in full with no cancellation. This is why I much prefer the eagle and wolf abilities, although I do see both of these as being equally kinda corner cutty, you can integrate them into regular stealth and parkour fairly smoothly. Still, they just don't feel particularly in keeping with the series ethos in regards to these systems and how they're built upon. Where additions like the Climb Leap or Smoke Bomb make parkour and stealth more multi-dimensional and open, these abilities make more expressive mechanics kind of obsolete, especially the Eagle. It feels like you presented with a choice to either engage with the DLC how intended, or to get the most out of Assassin's Creed's core gameplay pillars. Although I will say the Valley Forge mission where dogs can sniff you out, that's a highlight that has you thinking on your feet, and I think the wolf ability is far and away the best. And I do quite like the actual unlocks of the powers to be fair, especially the one where Connor fights the cast of the mouthwash adverts. Anyway, to loop back around to story, Washington just has an apple. He says he took it from a captured officer after the siege of Yorktown, and that's it. Of course by this point the truth had established that there are more than two apples, and we know Washington had the third from the truth, but him just happening upon it is or was strange, because Pieces of Eden are pretty devalued now, but a single apple back in 2012 or 2013 was a huge deal, and each had a history. I wish there was more to it than, yeah, I found it, because prior to Washington, it doesn't have a history. You could do anything with this specific apple. And so kind of dropping this one into the sea at the end doesn't feel poignant, when the apple has started to feel so ubiquitous and typical, and FDR just finds this one, 150 years later, or less. It's a small thing that only really preceded this shift towards the Pieces of Eden, completely losing their value, but it still bothers me. Just a, just a little bit. Also, Washington builds a pyramid in Manhattan as, I guess, the new capital. I mean, if, if his government even has a need for one. And this is strange. Even if you look past the goofiness on the surface of it all, which I think you kind of have to do. Surely the pyramid is a symbol of prosperity and innovation. In this context, it would make the most sense as a symbol of oppression and dominance, but you would kind of be assuming the misconception that the pyramids were built by slaves, so it's not like it justifies its own existence thematically. It's so silly, yet the very existence of the thing kind of asks that you take it seriously. I'm trying to be genuine here because everyone makes fun of this, but I cannot figure out what they were going for here. Is it just Washington being ostentatious? Why a pyramid? It's been almost a decade and I'm still baffled by this. What I did like though was uh, the, the rage quit. Seriously, it's a very endearing time capsule back to 2013. And I think that's about all I have to say on this one. Or, or actually, by the way, up until this point there was always a narrative reason as to why we relived the memories featured in one of these. And that's stopped now, but this is the first DLC without explanation, and it's also the most baffling one to not explain. Because otherwise you're led to believe that Desmond potentially hours from the end of the world, is just living out like the most deranged alt-history YouTube videos. But yeah, we've spent more than enough time on this one. Tyranny is one of the few DLCs that I don't just dislike, but I feel disappointed by. It's a shame to see such a wacky, yet very interesting concept wasted on a story that says absolutely nothing. The Hidden Ones expansion is the DLC that disappointed me the most on replay. In the three to five months after this expansion released, I probably played this three or four times. It was one of my favourite Assassin's Creed experiences out. I would replay Origins much too often, and the Hidden Ones was an essential part of that experience to me. One that was even better than the main game, which at the time, I really liked. I remember it doing a lot of good stuff, but above all, I remember it being this really meaningful story that added beautifully to the origin and philosophy of the Brotherhood, and in retrospect, 
it is not that. The story of the Hidden Ones is built upon the AC expansion standard. There is a threat subjugating the citizens of a new land. In this case, Rufio, a Roman ancient, is oppressing the Sinai with the help of his underlings. What comes of this is a rebellion that, naturally, you ally with, led by Gamelot. And this conflict is the groundwork for the establishment of some of the Hidden One's core values, namely one tenet of the Assassin's Creed and mention of another, which in concept is good. Origins certainly could have been better at the whole origin thing, but in delivery, the formation of this tenet central to this order, these characters, this franchise, it's really underwhelming. The main tenet established here is stay your blade from the flesh of an innocent, which is basically declared, albeit in different words, when Gamelot is assassinated. In and of itself, it's a really well-performed, solidly written scene, but this tenet is born through the violence, or violence by proxy, of a person who is only adjacent to the Hidden Ones, that you don't even really get to know that well over the course of this 90-minute, two-hour DLC. And still, Bayek speaks as if this is some established member of their order acting in their specific interests when he isn't. The canonization of one of the Creed's most central principles should surely carry much more weight than this. We know that Bayek, Aya, and even the more tangential hidden ones like Kashta probably wouldn't make martyrs of civilians by virtue of the fact that they aren't unabated psychopaths, at least as far as we can tell. I will kill everyone. So it doesn't feel like this moment of epiphany that the presentation and writing tells you that it is. Instead, it feels like a gigantic waste in regard to the Hidden Ones, to the relationships between these characters that are so deeply connected to the Order, and to other characters centuries out that serve this Order and live by these tenets. I think it would have been a lot more interesting and effective to have seen Bayek and or Aya directly making the kind of mistake that warrants this tenet. Maybe Aya, having spent four years as Amunet, has started to see herself and her work as being more important than the people it serves, disregarding human life to meet a greater end. I mean, anything is preferable to this, anything that doesn't feel so detached and hollow. There's never a moment where you're given time to relate to or care for this struggle in particular. There's no angle that ever presents the oppressed civilians as anything more than casualties, propelling the plot toward thoughtless fan service. And the antagonists are no better. Their individual outlooks and wrongdoings break down to, well, this guy is kind of a prick. And so finding out that Gamelot's been implicating villages in bloodshed so that they'll rise up against the evil ancients, it rings completely hollow for me. There are so many layers of detachment here, and. I could go on about how bad this is, but you get the point. It's just as empty as the whole, the hidden ones shouldn't fight in the open line. I realise it isn't as concrete of a foundation for that tenet as Gamelat's confession is for, you know, don't harm innocents, but it's just kind of strange. The need for their assassinations to be covert is, like, one of the main points of the foundation of their group. Surely, it's implicit in the name Hidden Ones. The need to repeat this so soon makes the Hidden Ones strange, poorly defined origins even murkier. It feels like these tenets should have been worked into the actual origin of the Hidden Ones instead of clumsily arriving at them later. And after that reiteration that a Hidden One shouldn't fight in the open, I think, I think the very next objective is to kill everyone in open combat. The elaboration on this already flimsy foundation of the Hidden Ones just ends up feeling empty. In fact, I don't think the DLC really delivers on a Hidden Ones feeling or fantasy in any regard. The assassinations are all forgettable in respect to quest design, story, and certainly in respect to their confessions, which aren't really confessions at all. The reasons for assassinating these targets, like I said earlier, are completely forgettable. They're just motiveless bastards who exist to die. I enjoy the Rufio assassination that was interestingly designed and posed a bit of a different challenge, but the first three ask that you infiltrate generic bandit camps and kill what may as well be just 
another nameless leader or captain. And the biggest subversion of expectations here is just a repeat of the lizard gimmick. Now, I don't think that every single target needs to be super compelling and game-changing, but in a DLC centered around the Hidden Ones in their formative years, it would be nice if targets were used to establish what the Hidden Ones are fighting against and why they should fight against it. If a single DLC needed compelling targets, assassinations, and confessions, it was this one, and they just aren't here. These assassinations end up feeling obligatory, almost like filler, a crime for any Assassin's Creed, DLC or not. The Hidden Ones themselves are also lacking. Tahira is mentor, or what would be the mentor of the Hidden Ones in the Sinai, and it's she that tells Bayek to immortalize the Creed, and it's her death that really motivates the final act of the expansion. It's strange how much importance the main game and this DLC imparts on a character you never really become that acquainted with. She appears in one side quest you can very easily miss in the main game that serves as her introduction. And if you do miss that, the game's third act is even more baffling than it otherwise is. And even that quest doesn't really make her feel like anything more than one of Egypt's many quest givers. Origins repeatedly assumes much more connection with the hero than we could possibly have, and it repeatedly suffers for it. As she lays dying, Bayek is pained. He describes Tahira as being as loyal as a mountain, but that loyalty, and even their relationship more broadly, is never truly tested. She's apparently a saviour to many. We don't see this, nor do we understand what that even means to her. Origins continues to tell and not show, even at an emotional climax. This scene, this crucial scene, feels like channel skipping and just kind of hanging around for a few minutes. The performances are strong, and it looks good, the soundtrack is emotional, but we're lacking all of the context to really connect with any of that emotion, and so it just feels empty and puts me at a complete disconnect with this story and these characters that I now feel less familiar with. I have been ragging on the story a bit, but some stuff I did like. The opening is... I think my favourite Origins scene. It's an effective introduction to this new story and a pretty good reintroduction of Bayek. You have the singer guy expositing, commiserating the Sinai in its darkest hour, and then Bayek stealthily and smoothly killing one of its oppressors, answering the call. And then that one-liner to remind you that he still has his charisma and charm. I also like Aya more in this one, although she and Bayek do still speak in bizarre platitudes from time to time. Even still, with those few positives, I was really disappointed playing this one, more so than with any of the other DLCs here. Virtually everything I remember loving about the Hidden Ones fell flat. The Scarab's son, I remember his side quest being fantastic, but it feels so rushed and empty. After four years of resentment, Bayek beats up this kid, tells him he'll kill him if he doesn't join his cult, and Kawab, in seconds, is just redeemed, making any of that hatred central to the main themes of the quest, forgiveness and growth, feel completely hollow. I'm sure this will be one of the more divisive placements on this list, and it was the one that I was the most unsure of. My recording software, it was fucked up, so I ended up playing this three times, and I spent the other two playthroughs desperately seeking whatever it was that made me like, love this DLC. I was sure that I was holding it to unfair scrutiny, or that I was just missing something, but after hours of poring over it, I just don't think it's very good. The spirit of Origins' main game really lingers, as the Hidden Ones fails to expand on the Brotherhood meaningfully, fails to create a captivating supporting cast, and it fails to transcend a box-ticking formula even in assassinations, which are surely paramount to an expansion explicitly about assassins. When I was writing this segment, I, I had to check myself a few times for repeating the words hollow and empty. But I realised that there's a reason, beyond having the creativity of an AC YouTuber, that my mind keeps resorting to those two words. Everything that impressed me so much five years ago, I now realise is devoid of substance, meaningful payoff, and certainly the genuine sentiment to engage me now. I really, really wish I had something nicer to say about this one, as this DLC was like quite important to me once, but with its many shortcomings, The Hidden One stands as one of the weaker Assassin's Creed expansions. Siege of Paris was something of a pleasant surprise for me, actually. My expectations for this were 
subsurface, and this expansion certainly isn't all bad. After the forgettable slog that was Wrath of the Druids, I very much expected the same thing here, and for the first hour that was an expectation that was vindicated. The setup, conflict, characters, all exhaustingly familiar, and the fatigue began to take over until the first assassination mission. And these assassinations are undoubtedly the crown jewel of the expansion. They're far from perfect, quite far, but you do have some of the essentials down, barring of course interesting targets among a few others that we'll get to. Investigations are back in a way, they're very different from AC1 obviously, everything's much more scripted, your hand is guided in certain directions, instead of being an authentic sandbox where you're just given the information and tools, and where any guidance is virtually invisible to the player who is just kind of let loose. And that is my biggest problem with these assassinations, that they don't trust you to be intelligent, and by extension they don't trust you to be independent. An example of Siege treating you like just a bit of a moron is this riddle, or puzzle, the last obstacle between you and your first target, comprising of two out in the open fires that simply need to be lit, like that's the final obstacle. And the lack of genuine trust and agency will take replayability out of these, but then again, these were never going to be as free or as focused as something like AC1, so I guess I do appreciate that step back in the right direction. It felt pretty clear to me that these were inspired by the new Hitman trilogy, especially in the cinematic gory deaths that could feel a little unearned given the underdeveloped AI written NPC on the receiving end of them. Still, for their flaws, I enjoy the simple appeal of finding my way in and out of a place, hiding in plain sight, killing and leaving unnoticed. Valhalla's unreliable detection did impede my enjoyment of the stealth, like, a lot, <laughs> but I guess that's not a part of the expansion so we'll let it slide. The rest of the expansion though isn't quite as enjoyable. I thought that time away from the game would do me good, I hadn't picked it up for probably 8 months when I played and wrote this, god this review is old, but still I found myself totally apathetic to the remaining 75% of the expansion. Every major player is just this interchangeable, trite, not even character, archetype. Just these banal, tired components rehashed and mixed and matched again and again with a new transparent coat of paint each time. I hate to be this much of a downer, but I cannot put into words how little I still care about the prospective naive Yal and the older conflict generating Yal who doesn't quite like the new way things are being done, again, or really any of these people that I know I'm never going to see again in a few hours time that can't have any lasting effect on Eivor because of this weird, bullshit, non-committal timeline. If Ubisoft hadn't made the baffling decision to have expansions take place along a weird, floating timeline, not only would you forego a lot of those issues I mentioned in the Druids and Ragnarok segments, you could really get a lot out of this setting specifically. France is hugely important to the Templar Order, especially in AC1, the game that follows Valhalla in terms of chronology. Everything this game does in respect to the Order of Ancients, Templars, is pretty fucking great, and just like with Tyranny, I find myself pained to see an opportunity to elaborate on great source material completely wasted, all because Ubisoft wanted these expansions to be playable from four hours in. Imagine what could have been done with an older Eivor, an Eivor with a better understanding of this conflict, seeing the consequences of her actions unfold as this order expands eastwards and plants itself into European bureaucracy. It annoys me so much here because we know when the Second Siege of Paris took place, and it's after the main story, and what we have in place of the Templars are the Bellators, another throwaway group that serves merely as a force for you to combat for a few hours. Within this story though, there were characters that did initially interest me, that then go on to make such contrived decisions that that just dies. Odo, for example, seemed as if he could have been compelling. The moment where he and Eivor come to a truce, salvaging some much needed honour as his wife lays dying was compelling to me, until he comes and tries to destroy that truce maybe 30 seconds later, making his core values that felt earnest and human that made him stick out as more than archetype fickle and flexible to a plot that needs to last another two hours. And then Eivor is clueless enough to talk of him as a man of honesty and honour, which is just baffling. Eivor's introspection and maturity in this DLC, which I did enjoy, is made somewhat hollow by her doing stupid shit that she is 
way too smart and experienced to do it, honestly, any point in Valhalla. Like leaving Siegfried alone in a church with children. You know, the same children they were arguing about him potentially killing not too long before, just to accelerate this conflict arbitrarily. The story also suffers from a lot of general Valhalla goofiness. Like the moment where Rashardis is burning at the stake and Eivor just kind of lets it happen for a full minute to do an epic entrance and then face off moment. I, I think I literally had to pause because it was that funny to me. Then you've got lots of facial animations just being bad, like a lot worse than in the main game. And there's lots of moments where you have this confluence of bizarre, almost inhuman character animations and poor, empty sound design that makes both the characters you're conversing with and the environments they're conversing in totally unbelievable. Still, the story does have its redeeming elements, primarily this darker, grim tone that is upheld quite well, with little, if any, poorly placed humour. Paris was a lot of fun, and there's some really great parkour routes in there. I haven't touched the rest of Valhalla in a long while, but I think it might be the best designed city in the game, which does make it a mighty shame that you can't access it after the main story, which is insane creating the best designed city we'd had in the better part of a decade letting you traverse in it and then pulling it from you is such a strange devilish move that makes zero sense but yeah siege is just kind of bland outside of a few fun but flawed assassinations a, a pretty good boss fight and france itself being rather nice it's a mediocre dlc if there ever was one but one i might be inclined to replay the Battle of Folly has to be the biggest drop-off in quality from main game to DLC, acting as an arbitrary buffer and pace killer bookended by much better content. The Battle of Folly is mandatory if you're playing Assassin's Creed 2 via the Ezio collection, which most people will be these days, and so it's an absolute pace butcher. It's at the end of the 11th sequence that Ezio formally completes his transformation into an assassin. With this reminder of just how far Ezio's come, it feels as if he's being readied up for a final mission, not this smaller, less additive action before the final mission. I can forgive Bonfire on this front because Ezio has a realisation that's crucial to the game's ending and Ezio's arc, but Bonfire doesn't serve that much of a purpose to the overarching story. With DLC becoming commonplace in these kind of games at the time, it does feel, like many AC DLCs, that a story was reverse engineered from the demand for one. The entire setup is bizarre. Ezio decides to hide the apple in Folly for some reason, away from the assassins in a political stronghold that will probably always have eyes on it. But as far as wacky misadventures go, the cast for this one is pretty fun. You've got Machiavelli and mainly a lot of Katarina. I actually wouldn't be surprised if she was the motivation for a Folly-based DLC, given how brief her appearance is in the main game and how important she was going to be in Brotherhood. She's the highlight of the DLC and sparks a lot of life into this conflict where the Orsi brothers kind of don't. I get what they were going for with these smug psychopaths, but they end up feeling kind of dull and they aren't nearly as threatening as they probably should be. The fantastic Andreas Apergis really nailed that kind of performance the next year with Brotherhood. And that's not to say that he's bad as Kako, he just didn't have a particularly compelling script to work with. Honestly, I'm spending most of their one real scene, or I guess there's two, watching Savonarola lurk about Foley, which, as a setting, is fairly weak. It's drab and dirty, which is fine, some worlds should be, plenty of great worlds are, but in a game with superbly designed cities with their own attributes and characteristics, Foley really falls short. Florence is Ezio's home. The sound, the people, and the colours associated with it are quaint. Its wealth is reflected in architecture, the palazzos, and the great cathedrals. Then you've got San Gimignano, which is very vertical. It poses climbing challenges, and arches are a serious problem here. Venice is bustling and densely packed together. Traversing the floating city is very different to traversing Florence. There's a kind of floor is lava element to it. The worst thing that can happen during a run is the kind of mistake that leaves you slowly swimming ashore to start all over again. Each city has a unique colour palette, sound, and traversal dynamic that helps make it, and the sequences tied to it, feel more distinct. Foley isn't special, 
All it really has to distinguish itself is its colour, which again, is drab. The city is an unfriendly host to a series of uninteresting missions consisting mostly of open combat. If you know what you're doing, AC2's combat system is pretty decent, but this DLC is characterised by combat. I mean, it's the Battle of Forley, which makes Sequence 12 an even bigger anomaly. The main game keeps all three gameplay pillars engaged, combat, stealth, parkour and it's parkour that is pretty much completely absent from this expansion. Stealth isn't shafted quite as much. In fact, I do really like Ludovico's assassination. The lighthouse is a great, really well-designed obstacle between you and him. But generally, there isn't a lot more to be said, which I think is to the favour of Battle of Folly. That it's only 45 minutes long and doesn't end up dragging too much because of that. This story didn't need to be mandatory playing by any means. It's an okay side adventure that doesn't really fit into the main story. It's kind of cool, but I didn't need to know where Ezio got the map to the codex, and besides that, the Battle of Folly isn't really that additive. It's a decent, fine DLC that probably appears to be a bit worse than it is, purely because of its placement and the fact that it pales in comparison to the rest of the spectacular game that it's attached to. It has its strengths, but it's probably one of the more middle-of-the-road Assassin's Creed expansions. Curse of the Pharaohs was one of the more pleasantly surprising expansions to replay. As I said earlier, I played Origins over and over in the months following its release, and after completing this in April 2018 as a rabid 14-year-old Origins superfan, I was actually quite disappointed. This didn't feel like it added anything to this character and this game that I adored. The story felt like the most formulaic of Origins side quests, stretched out to 4 or 5 hours with no satisfying conclusion, and I didn't think that emphasis on fantasy in aesthetic and story really belonged. There was a lot more I wanted to see from this game, from Bayek, Aya, the Hidden Ones, it just didn't do a lot for me. But picking this up for a second time, Christ, nearly half a decade later, I think that this is the best that AC Origins has to offer. It's not a masterpiece or anything, and many of those drawbacks still stand, but there's some good, even some really good stuff in here. For a start, there is some personal motivation in Bayek's quest, even if it isn't really tapped into enough. He's seeing another artifact rupture another community, only now he's in a position to stop it. I really like the scene where Sutek accuses Bayek of having lost nothing. In another excellently performed scene, we're reminded of what Bayek's lost and what drives him. He feels less passive and disconnected than the protagonists of a fair few of the other expansions. And for that first, I don't know, hour, 45 minutes, there is a sense of well-crafted intrigue here that feels well worth investigating. Unfortunately though, that does fairly quickly dissolve until you're back going through Origins' regular motions. It's the worst thing about it. I'm not allowed to forget that I'm playing Assassin's Creed Origins. In the moments before that can happen, I'm tasked with rescuing a person I do not know from people I do not know in a place I do not know for a person I mean, you've played the fucking thing, right? I've no clue at what point during production it was decided that The Hidden Ones was going to be the short DLC and this the long one, or if that was always the plan, but Curse would be so much better off for having a similar length to The Hidden Ones that accommodates this story's natural beginning, middle, and end, rather than nailing the jump and landing in half speed. This intrigue has meandered and died by the halfway point, as you're just doing the same odd jobs you've done for the last 30 hours, instead of making the most of this cast of varied characters with differing motivations. I like them well enough, but not enough time is spent distinguishing their motives and creating a sense of stakes. You have a very typical modern AC story, where some traitor or interloper is established, and you'll have to rack your brains about which of the three other guys it could be. It's just another Origins quest made long. Origins' very restrictive foundations are only made more apparent when they're applied to some of the most visually inspired landscapes the series has to offer. The first thing that happens entering the Field of Reeds, this striking, wondrous location of huge importance to Bayek, is the delegation of three odd jobs that have you running around smashing jars, dropping a torch on a thing, and then washing your face. It's a real shame, honestly, and Curse being tied to Origin's formula is what keeps it from hitting the highest spots. After a point, the story has fizzled out completely, and the quest design is hardly picking up any slack. Bandits are taking people. 
Why? Now, fantasy is central to this expansion. I stand by what I said earlier. I don't think it will ever really belong, but it has more place here than it does in something like Odyssey. Bayek's religion is central to his character. He is incredibly spiritual, like most of his countrymen. And so it makes sense for the Duat and Aten to be projected onto this deeply theistic society. Bayek is aware that what he's seeing isn't real, and unlike Fate of Atlantis, there's never a moment he treats these happenings as being real for the sake of empty drama. And because of this, Bayek is fairly disconnected from all of the things that he's seeing when he's completely aware that they're illusory, which I think is kind of a shame. You really could get a lot out of Bayek thinking that he's entered the Duat, but the worlds themselves are very visually striking and distinct from one another. When I think of this DLC, it's these landscapes that I think of and the music that accompanies them. Curse's soundtrack was composed by Elitsa Alexandrova, I hope that's it, and I think she's really good. She did Rogue 2, and that soundtrack I do also quite like. Bosses are another thing that Curse gets right. With some notable exceptions, this trilogy doesn't have the best batting average when it comes to interesting boss fights. But Curse is an exception to the trend with some unique opponents that pose unique challenges, such as Ahenaton and his slow, sweeping strikes. Unfortunately though, the main story just doesn't end on the best note. It felt like they just didn't know what to do with this apple, so they had Bayek bafflingly give it to Sutek, a fairly untrustworthy guy. I guess to bait a sequel, or at least that's what we thought it was at the time. Internally, Sophia must have knew that Bayek wasn't getting one, so this is really strange. Anyway, I think that this one is fairly middle of the road. The Jack the Ripper DLC was the first big piece of new Assassin's Creed content in my many years as a fan that I didn't get. In the weeks, because it really wasn't that long, uh, between the release of Syndicate and its first DLC, I had soured on the game so much that I had no desire to touch it again. And this was only consolidated by this terrible portrayal of Jack the Ripper that I kept on hearing about. So picking it up years later, expecting it to be awful, I was surprised to learn that the DLC is a huge improvement on the main game. One of my biggest qualms with Syndicate was tone. There was this sense that no action, no matter its size, harbored any consequence. And lots of things that should have been taken seriously just weren't. And when they were, there was often a hell of a tonal whiplash from the quip that would come either before or after. But from the off with Jack the Ripper, there's this ominous, gorgeous cinematic, a weary, more serious Jacob, and a new soundtrack composed by the fantastic Bear McCreary that really bolsters this new, sinister tone. <laughs> but we're not that far down the list yet, there are still some big, big problems, chiefly the titular Jack the Ripper who somehow guts that tone. Just looking at him is enough to annihilate any chance of him being intimidating, because visually there is a lot to run with, an assassin turned serial killer. That's an unusual concept waiting to be capitalized on. Instead, he's just wearing a standard Jacob outfit with a fucking bag on his head. I mean, everything from the performance, the, the accent, the comically evil letters, the screaming, the flashing and hacking effects to make sure you understand how fucked up and psycho he is. Because I guess five gruesome murders didn't cut it, you gotta dish out one line as to showcase just how detached saucy Jack is from it all. I don't know how you take a figure as inherently disturbing as Jack the Ripper and make him a joke, while trying so desperately to do the exact opposite. Well, come to think of it, that is why. It's desperate. Both writing and general messaging beat you over the head with silliness, with one-liners and smarm and caustic, comical sadism. By the time you take on Jack's perspective, for some reason, any opportunity for genuine sympathy is unsalvageable. Too much time has been spent overselling the evil of the man through these cheap, tonally dissonant methods, instead of letting that genuine evil speak for itself, which it does. A glance at Jack the Ripper's Wikipedia page is more disturbing than this, genuinely, and that's nuts considering that there's an all too vain effort to humanize Jack into more than a list of murders. Jack's experience with the Brotherhood and their perceived failings of him is the would-be beating heart of this DLC. If they nail Jack, who is at the core of this story, I'd place the expansion a few spots higher, easily. The fact that the tone is so exceptionally crafted and then so thoroughly failed, it, it kills me. Of everything on this list, Jack the Ripper is the biggest, saddest failing of potential. This underdog DLC kind of rising up from a poor game to amend many of its errors 
only to fall victim to the very worst of them. It's a huge shame because every other character here is solid. There is real palpable dramatic tension between Evie and Abilene that beats anything from the main game and serves to remind you there are actual stakes here. A feeling I don't think I ever felt in Syndicate regardless of its sometimes colossal scale. The loss of a single life here packs a much meaner punch than any of the I mean, the tragedies from the main game. Evie as a protagonist is quite enjoyable. She's older, wiser, a lot of growth has clearly happened. It is a bit of a shame that we never got to see any of it for those 20 years. I mean, discounting that one comic, but I wouldn't count that. Because Evie does really act her age in this, like a matured version of her 20-year-old self. She's middle-aged here, and she looks it too. Like, actually looks it. Not like a video game 40-year-old, but a real middle-aged woman to to some people chagrin apparently uh, the crime scenes here yeah are quite derivative and much too easy but they really ground the mystery and the weight of the expansion these women are made to feel like lost lives instead of the justification of a new checklist to complete the big new mechanic is fear which for what it is is decent you can basically frighten your enemies by using some repurposed tools and mainly fear takedowns these brutal kills which while goofy are not exactly helping any of those issues that jack has in regard to tone differentiate him in play to evie according to his very different personality or actually not because evie can also use these for some reason, which I think was the complete wrong move. These brutal kill animations meant to traumatize guards into fleeing or freezing up completely should be exclusive to Jack, because not only would it firmly separate the two in terms of playstyle, with one being abrasive and reliant on sheer brutality, and the other more graceful and thoughtful, but because these are outright cruel and feel so out of character for Evie to use. There's a sense of dissonance in Evie being so disappointed and disgusted by Jack and his vicious tactics, and then her using them. It's not that big of a deal, but I kind of wish they came up with something else or just omitted this from her toolset. Especially when most of the time that you have an opportunity to use fear as Eevee, it's just gonna end up alerting more guards to your presence, making use of it pointless. In terms of side activities, the existence of all of them is just as arbitrary side content. Like, I struggle to believe that anyone was jumping for joy at the prospect of creating Nelly and Weaversbrook activities. And that's another thing, the existence of Jack's gang is so dumb and exists solely to be the focus of this pointless, bad side content. There had to be some kind of enemy faction to be the face of all of the usual side mission types, even if that came at the detriment of the narrative. Sure, it's occasionally and very flimsily theorised that Jack the Ripper's attributed murders were committed by a group, but he does all of the killing on his own, and this is just a gang of converted rooks. There's no assassin or Templar basis, they don't have principles, it's just a totally hollow addition that only further flanderises Jack into this silly cockney killer man. And it's mainly this very unfortunate portrayal that leaves Jack the Ripper as a perfectly playable, decent DLC, when it could have, and should have been, quite a lot more. Freedom Cry is an all-round fairly solid DLC, notable for switching its protagonist and completely diverging from the main game. As I touched on in the Ragnarok section, I don't mind a DLC that splinters from the main game, because these kinds of deviating stories, when done right, will elaborate on the main game, in play, theme, and story generally. And Freedom Cry builds on a few components of Black Flag to varying degrees of success. The most significant of these components would of course be Adewale, who is in a completely different role as a protagonist. In Black Flag, Adewale is basically Edward's foil, and by nature that deprives him of a lot of Edward's overt leading man qualities. Where Edward is brash, unbothered, and very avoidant when it comes to his issues, Ade is quiet, principled, and very reflective. It's his well-meaning confrontations with Edward that give way for some of the strongest moments in a very strong story. So putting Edward to one side for his stoic counterpart was a, a pretty audacious move that I think yields mixed results. So Adewale is on assassin business intercepting a package, the precursor box, 
He retrieves it, but is shipwrecked on Saint Domingue. He meets the intended recipient, Bastien Joseph, madam of the local brothel, and she promises to give him a ship or passage off the island for helping out the Maroons. And from there, Ade neglects whatever assassin mission he had to aid the Maroons, growing more and more invested in their cause. Now this, in and of itself, isn't something that I take issue with. As a former slave and an assassin, it makes sense for him to aid their cause. In every conversation with Bastien, you can hear him becoming more attached, and impassioned as he takes on this starry-eyed idealism. Tristan D. Lalla is really great in this, and I'd say that his performance makes Ade a deeper character. But unfortunately, he fails to be a particularly compelling protagonist because there's a total lack of conflict and growth here. Adewale chooses to abandon the assassins for two years to pursue a cause that, while just and deeply personal to him, isn't theirs. It's a very human choice, but one that isn't even really depicted as a choice. He states a few times that he needs to return to the assassins, and when he doesn't, there's no conflict or consequence. He just goes back to them after a while, and nothing has changed. He hasn't changed. The DLC ends with Adewale talking about a tide shifting within him how he now has complete conviction in the creed and freedom. But this is who he's been since the halfway point of Black Flag, or thereabouts. All of the things that he's discussing as revelation here, he preached to Edward. And despite being really well performed and having some solid moments, Ade just feels static in this. He makes mention of being an older man now, but he's in the exact same position he was roughly 15 years before. And so those really strong, excellently scored moments feel inconsequential. When Adewale's understanding of just how important freedom is, is at the very foundation of his character and Edward's development in Black Flag. The Maroon War is a prime conflict for telling a compelling story with this character, but it's taken in the complete wrong direction and concluded in a very unsatisfying way, despite there being moments that in isolation I quite like, in large part because of the brilliant soundtrack composed by Olivier de Rivieri, who also composed both Plague games. The Storm is an absolute highlight to the intense strings of Oak 60's horror, and other tracks feel just as emotional and intense. In a franchise made up of some unreal soundtracks, Freedom Cry stands fairly strong. It's one of the few things that actually gives Port Au Prince a sense of character, because it does otherwise feel a lot like another city or town from the main game, with few things really making it stand out. I will say that the Jailers are an apt addition, needing to be wary of these walking restricting areas that will sick guards on you. It's a nasty way of emphasising the bleak situation of Ade and the Maroons, even in free roam. And most of the expansion side activities are centred around liberating slaves and building up the Maroon Rebellion. At least one mission is locked off until you've recruited a certain number, and the stronger the Rebellion gets, the more weapons and upgrades they're able to give you. Some external, gameplay-based motivation for liberation is certainly a good thing. The issue is that that can easily end up overshadowing any intrinsic motivation. Like, locking missions behind freeing slaves is to the detriment of the expansion's themes. It happened to me at the start and then not again because I did do a lot of side content fairly early on, but this can happen, I think, five or so times. And in a story centered around the inhumanity of slavery, a player should never end up thinking, ugh, I gotta go liberate slaves again. In fact, liberation missions do get really repetitious. There's a few encounters in the open world, but these aren't really ideal, because slave ships and plantations yield greater numbers for what's not really a lot of effort. The plantations are all fairly similar in terms of design, and the slave ships are the same activity placed at different points in the ocean. These get really repetitive, and there's no human element to them, which comes at the cost of the very weighty themes of the expansion. These are activities you should never feel apathetic to or fatigued by. Unfortunately, motivation ends up being almost entirely extrinsic. Despite setting up these weird checkpoints, the actual story never conveys the growth of the Maroons, the cause that Adewale has dedicated himself to. Augustine, their leader, is the face of the group, but he's in three brief cutscenes that fail to really make the group more than an idea represented by numbers. Although it's Quebec's best creation by a stretch, it's easy to see the seeds of Syndicate and Odyssey's design here. If Ade and Augustine had more of a relationship, if he was somebody who you wanted to help, who reminded you of the gravity of the situation and the real people affected, liberation missions might feel like more than busy work, which is the very last thing they should be 
in a DLC like this, led by this character. Although I will say that the slave ships do ask for some level of caution, as if you damage them, captives will die. It makes for a different, more considerate naval combat dynamic, instead of just rushing in and fucking everything up. Generally though, the naval aspect of this DLC is a bit underwhelming. You're given a new ship, the Experto Crede, and upgrades to it are linked to liberation missions. The issue is that there's not really any motivation to actually upgrade the ship. You can deal with most threats without any upgrades, and there's no big naval challenge to encourage you to actually perfect the Crede. Beating a really high level fort or a legendary ship makes all the effort you put into the jackdaw feel worthwhile. And here, there's nothing to put you to the test, and just one challenge would have gone a long way. And while naval is a little underwhelming here, stealth isn't. The really well-designed stealth missions are the highlights of this DLC for me, peaking with the manifest swap. This infiltration mission that has two cycling invulnerable targets in Gadan and the Harbormaster, who you can't kill without failing the mission. The blunderbuss is also surprisingly useful in stealth when dealing with these conspicuously clustered groups of guards. Another weapon that Freedom Cry adds is the machete, which has some great finisher animations that are fittingly brutal. While Freedom Cry is certainly one of the better Assassin's Creed DLCs, I just wish that Adewale had a more compelling story here. I really like the character, I like seeing more of him, but this story concludes with him having gone through no change or arc. Still, it's decent and is, at the very least, a few hours of Kenway era fun. The Bonfire of the Vanities is a strange one with its share of shortcomings, but one that ultimately comes up on the better side of things. The setup I quite like. Using the apple, Savonarola has brainwashed Florence's most influential figures in the merchantry, military, medicine, and so on. Or actually, he hasn't brainwashed all of them. Something I really like about this DLC are its confessions, which pose some really interesting reasons for these men submitting to somebody like Savonarola. Ezio is sorry to kill two or three of them who truly didn't know what they were doing. Others didn't need convincing, and were behind Savonarola's plot to destroy alternative knowledge. It's the captain who dies angry with himself for being so susceptible to the promise of power, and my favourite is the nobleman, who Ezio is quite sharp with because he capitulated. He allowed himself to be influenced by the apple. The issue here, and with the assassinations more broadly, is a lack of meaningful context. These are really interesting ideas, but because I don't know the captain, or the doctor, or any of these men so devoid of character that they aren't given names, they remain ideas, and not the believable, compelling worldviews you'd see in a game like AC1, which this DLC mistakenly draws a lot of parallels to. I say it was a mistake because it makes the failure of this concept a lot more conspicuous. A good example of this is the farmer, who mirrors a Bulnikov. He's hated by the people and seen as unworthy, so he acts against them. And that's as far as you get with his 25 seconds of characterization. A bull, on the other hand, says that he's hated for his nature. He's acne-ridden, obese, and in some interpretations of his confession, gay. He has no desire to serve a god who hates him, and years of palpable resentment can be felt in his speech and following confession. He points out hypocrisies in the creed, in Altair, building on this growing doubt that he has in the Brotherhood and al Mualim. This target, in spite of his wrongdoings, is sympathetic and supplemental to the overarching narrative and Altair's development. The farmer is not sympathetic. The story and world are indifferent to his death, and individually he has zero effect on Ezio. This is one example, but all nine targets are like this. AC1 does a great job establishing who these people are and why they have such strong conviction. Each assassination is a lesson learned and a plot foiled. Each has a tangible part to play. Despite cute reference to AC1, Bonfire doesn't carry this over. There's a lack of context, development, and consequence in regard to each individual killing. By the fifth or sixth assassination, a sense of fatigue sets in from this non-stop killing which really starts to feel senseless. It's a shame because some of these assassinations are really solid. There's an openness to some of these that the main game doesn't really present to you very often. And that's not to say that any linearity is bad, it's often pretty great in the main game assassinations, but here it feels like being presented this big final challenge that allows you to exercise the many tools and abilities you've unlocked over the course of the game. Which would score this some more points were it not for the fact that that's what sequence 14 
kind of already is. I really enjoy these missions for what they are, it's just structure that kind of fucks them. The missions in relation to one another, and the sequence in relation to the game. You're jumping from assassination to assassination, back to back. When assassinations are frequent to the point of losing novelty, and so lacking in context that they feel totally detached, they unfortunately begin to feel like busy work, regardless of how well crafted they are individually. And that detachment is only heightened by non-linearity. The Doctor could be your first or final target. He and the story are ambivalent either way. Uncharacteristic of classic AC, progression feels most well represented in the numbers. The mist slowly clearing with each assassination is neat, and you have LaVolpe and Paola leading the people through the scene of each assassination, but I don't think it's enough to offset the I guess this stillness you feel as you single-handedly level like the Florentine upper class. So when you kind of zoom out to macro scale and look at Bonfire of the Vanities as sequence 13, it feels like an hour-long buffer. These two DLCs feel like misadventures placed at the worst possible time that I always end up rushing through because the game has set up something a lot more interesting. The whole thing is just a recipe for fatigue, which in the final hours of your game, your fantastic otherwise well-paced game is infuriating, especially when there's good stuff here. These really should have remained just impaired memories, and you should have been able to just go back and experience them as side adventures. With that said though, there is a single moment in this DLC that elevates it into so much more than an assassination compilation, and that's Ezio's speech, one of the strongest moments in this franchise. In this moment you can see all of the charisma and magnetism that Ezio had as a boy, only now he's using it in a display of maturity and marked growth. In the same place his family were killed, Ezio watches the crowd cheer on another cruel execution. Only now, as a man, as an assassin, he can provide Savonarola with the mercy that his family weren't given. Here, Ezio is the saviour, the protector that he couldn't be two decades ago. This moment is an excellently written and performed benchmark for Ezio's monumental growth. It's here that his character arc has really come full circle, establishing the kind of man that Ezio is going into the Vatican. A wise man who has complete resolve and understanding in the assassin mission, all without losing sight of his humanity, making his decision to spare Rodrigo understandable and compelling, but that's a can of worms for another time. This moment is what comes to mind when I think of Bonfire of the Vanities, and for that I did want to score this higher. Originally, Bonfire was, I think, second on this list, and for as much as its conclusion does elevate Bonfire, it suffers far too much for its structuring and lacking exposition to place it much higher. Which is a shame, because I like a lot of the DLC in isolation. The ghosts at the Villa Auditore feel like quite a lot more than an easter egg, as Ezio's loss is instrumental to his development here. I love the dialogue from the townsfolk as you enter the Altrano district, them wishing for the Assassino to come back and save them, and others disputing his existence as myth. There is a lot to like, and if you made this DLC a series of side missions akin to the Da Vinci disappearance, and if you cut the targets down from 9 to, say, 3 that were fleshed out and grounded in the story, this could be the best Assassin's Creed DLC, but that is quite a, a different picture, and as it stands, it's flawed, but it certainly has its merits. The Lost Archive is an acquired taste if there ever was one, and I completely understand why some people dislike the DLC, hate it even. The gameplay is not even in the same vein as the main game, it's this puzzle platformer in the first person, and its narrative is all modern day, which as time goes on is only less popular. So yeah, it is a pretty big deviation from established formula, then and now, though it's one that I think is for the better when it comes to modern day centred stuff like this. Desmond is reliving class memories via the Black Room, and Formula simply wouldn't accommodate this, at least not very well. Pre-AC3, there was always a clear line between the way that the past and the present operated. Even those two missions in Brotherhood that are functionally tombs are completely different. They're built entirely around story and cooperation, with Lucy, Sean, Rebecca, and of course there's no HUD because you're not in the Animus. It feels different, and that line isn't super difficult to draw when you're packing each game with maybe 
30 minutes of modern day spread over the course of a full-sized game. So the devs were put in a strange position when deciding how exactly they were going to tell the stories of Desmond in Desmond's journey, and by extension Clay in Lost Archive because leaping from rooftops and slipping between crowds just wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Clay's story is one of turbulence, uncertainty, and loneliness. It's a tragedy. And all of these things can and have been conveyed exceptionally well in a third-person action-adventure format. I mean, look no further than this series. But I think this format is much more accommodating of Clay's decline, as well as the strange circumstances that allow us to view it. Clay is never given form or voice here. You are basically an observer drifting through a troubled, declining consciousness. And what this allows for is fantastic environmental and auditory storytelling completely unique to this Assassin's Creed experience. And since this is an Assassin's Creed experience, in the traditional sense, I guess I can't keep running from the gameplay. None of my many appraisals absolve the floatiness of the movement, or the fact that your range of vision is restricted to the first person, which really doesn't work with some of the more precise movements that are asked of you, or the fact that some levels leave you completely lost without direction or location indicators, well before that would service the story. With all that said, you're probably wondering why this is all the way up here. And put simply, it's because this is the greatest narrative an Assassin's Creed expansion has told to date. And really, in terms of story, the series has only had me this engaged a handful of times since, if even that. As much as gameplay is far from ideal, the very most is made of this strange new format. The imagery used here is gorgeous and eerie, pairing with this fantastic, hollowing soundtrack and really vivid sound design to depict a decline into severe mental illness and then death in a very compelling way. Doing any big, series-wide ranking is always kind of difficult, purely because there's been so many different incarnations of Assassin's Creed that are doing different things, made by different people, appealing to different people. But story will always be paramount through every rendition, and this is truly one of the series' greatest, and certainly its most experimental. I replayed this after powering through Dawn of Ragnarok, and Archive really makes me yearn for the days that this series would regularly take narrative risks that aren't to everyone's taste, because no great stories really are. Replaying this really made me reflect on this vain mission to curb all edges in the hopes of making the most consumable product possible. And it's narrative that suffered the most for this, because to make a narrative universally appealing is to strip it of its spine, its ambition, its uniqueness, without exception. And those three qualities are what made this series' storytelling so special and groundbreaking. I don't want to sound like a complete cynic, because I'm honestly quite optimistic about some of the current lineup, especially in regard to narrative, but Man, it's been a rough console generation. I know this is all a bit of a trite sentiment, and one you're likely familiar with as an Assassin's Creed fan, but I hadn't felt that yearning for the boldness that once characterised Assassin's Creed storytelling this acutely for a long time before replaying The Lost Archive, which is a far cry from the expansions of the last 18 months or so. But in putting accessibility so far before story via this semi-non-chronology, and the excessive reuse of tired components restrict themselves from ever being as intense, creative, and certainly as memorable as The Lost Archive. It speaks volumes that the gameplay kind of sucks, and still, this is a much more memorable video game experience than the vast majority of what's come since. I'm kind of old now, I can't clock in an 8-hour shift burning through bandit camps as a number slowly increases, without descending into utter insanity. I just can't do it anymore. This is the kind of video game experience that I find much more attractive. Something ambitious, a bit experimental, with concision and purpose. With that said, it isn't completely concise, and there is some excess fat in here. There's two or three levels that could have been shortened considerably. It, it really does feel like Ubisoft went out of their way to justify the then $15 price tag, especially considering that the Da Vinci disappearance was $5 cheaper. Also, as a meta issue that I don't fault the DLC itself for, there is crucial modern day content in here. If you didn't cough up $15, you were going to fall behind on the series' overarching story. I've not touched on it yet because I don't think it's fair to fault individual DLCs for this, 
but I dislike paid expansions pushing the overarching story. I could kind of see why Ubisoft would take this route as more hardcore fans enjoy the modern day story and more hardcore fans are gonna buy DLC, but I hate to imagine how many people have been completely lost on the main story of this series because they didn't pay for DLC, especially seeing as recaps have been a thing of the past for a long time. But that's getting really off point. I love The Lost Archive. It's one of the single most honest and touching depictions of depression, isolation, and everything that follows I've experienced probably in this medium as a whole. And I'm not just talking again about art direction or soundtrack, but the performances, the writing, the emails between Clay and both of his parents are brutal. And again, very real in the way that they all have different writing styles that change. Clay's excitement about having found the assassins and a purpose is palpable and fucking crushing. And because the narrative is so strong, I can kind of... I won't say excuse some of the shoddy gameplay and design because I don't, but it certainly mitigates that enough for me to look upon the Lost Archive very favourably. I really love The Da Vinci Disappearance. This is the DLC with the strongest cast, the most well-integrated history, and the best mission design. It's just really strong through and through, and one of those DLCs that's so strong it ends up feeling like mandatory play. More Ezio and Leonardo is of course a plus, and Salai is a great addition. It's strange to think that he and Leonardo don't share a scene in the entire expansion, because you do get a sense that the two are very genuinely close. Salai knows knows who Ezio is, he knows about the apple, about Ezio's eagle vision, and he has to clue Ezio in on pretty much all of this. It's a kind of sad suggestion that in the few years Ezio was chasing Cesare, he completely lost touch with his closest friend who now has complete reliance on Salai, and both he and Leonardo fail to hide their affections in a very organic, sweet way without ever outright declaring any kind of relationship. The game illustrates just how much they care about one another. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it's the kind of showing and not telling in regard to relationships that I mentioned something like the hidden ones lacking a little bit early. And their relationship serves as this additional motive on this quest to reclaim the six Da Vinci paintings. And the way that art of the time, hugely important art, is integrated into the plot in a very Assassin's Creed way, is fantastic. This is the AC DLC format done right, and not just because of historical context, but certainly mission design. Right off the bat, you're thrown into the Ferrara estate to recover Annunciation, and this memory is just fantastic, one of the best in the game. It's another of Brotherhood's missions that is set in an entirely new, one-off location. Lucrezia's third and final husband, the Duke of Ferrara, is in ownership of Annunciation, so this is an excuse for you to infiltrate this big estate and to revisit Lucrezia. It starts with this linear stealth segment that has you navigating the stables and gardens as the whole place is being shut down at Lucrezia's demand. And the mission ends with this big chase sequence as Ezio escapes the manor. It's a really great sequence that, beyond being very fun and well designed, showcases the massive wealth of Lucrezia that's done absolutely nothing to make her any happier. She's paranoid and incredibly lonely, and I like that we do check back in with her after losing her family. It's nice. Another returning character is Duccio, who has apparently maintained his 14-year-old fashion sense, and this one is a bit more of a combat challenge. What I really like about the hunt for the paintings is that each core gameplay pillar is given attention, and each mission feels distinct and well-designed. Or, barring the one tailing mission that is at least kind of notable for introducing Eccoli and the Hermeticist philosophy. And Hermeticism was another historical integration that I really like. Eccoli assumes that Ezio would be supportive of their cause because he believes in the pursuit of truth. And Ezio shuns Eccoli for trying to force that truth. His philosophy mirrors a lot of Brotherhood's truth segments about Abstergo's ideal new world order, stripping humanity of all of the options and ideas deemed incompatible with this utopia. Only the Hermeticists would share their enlightenment, where the Templars would kind of hoard theirs and use it to subjugate. I find their brief place in this grand conflict to be really interesting. I, I just wish that the expansion explored this a bit, or <laughs> a lot more, through Eccoli, because you can really see that assassiny idealism in each of his brief appearances, only he's desensitized to his violent means because he has 
you know, the same level of conviction as Robert or Haytham. I wouldn't say that it's detrimental to the DLC because it isn't really about their group, but the inkling of that conflict is, it's quite good regardless, even if it isn't fully realized. And those two final memories are just pure Assassin's Creed magic. Using your eagle vision to decipher a hidden message beneath historically significant artwork, leading you to an Isu temple so you can help your descendant like, save the world, or while bringing another villainous plot to heel. That final 20 minutes has almost everything. It it repurposes real history to evoke mystery and conspiracy. It connects Isu to ancestor to descendant. It poses some philosophical questions about freedom and the attainment of truth. A brilliant tomb that engages traversal and combat. There's charming character writing and thoughtfully implemented soundtrack. It's truly a fantastic DLC that expands on the main game really meaningfully. That The ending always gets me. Ezio now having a complete understanding that this isn't meant for him and leaving the vault. Just like Bonfire of the Vanities, it's a good establishment of who Ezio's going to be going into the main game, at least in respect to his role as prophet. The final conversation with Leonardo is also just great, him dropping everything to talk about his art and ambitions. It is a really spectacular expansion, and barring Lost Archive, or my- no, I, I think this is my, my second favourite story in one of these, but it is close. And I think that Dead King's achieving what it does is really impressive, given the fact that it's one of the shortest Assassin's Creed DLCs. It's 90 minutes, if that, of linear missions, but each one of those missions is so well written and designed that I would say the Da Vinci Disappearance stands head and shoulders above most of its much larger counterparts. Dead Kings is the defining Assassin's Creed expansion. In the opening, like, three minutes, everything just kind of hits. You're being smacked in the face with those fantastic, perfectly miserable AC1 vibes. This descent into a glum, compact, grimy city, perfect for an assassin. Then into this dimly lit pub where the degeneracy is really concentrated, as a stoic assassin wordlessly floods the room with anxiety, with his huge, ghostly presence. Th this entire opening, I just love. Arno's fucking eye roll when the bartender starts doing the big monologue call to action, and the implication that Arno's been drinking himself sick again, with the bartender calling on his tap. The big, charismatic hero is completely absent in the wake of Elise's death, which happens, I'm pretty sure, like a week before this. In less than two minutes, you have Arno subverting a few of his heroic qualities, with the kind of indifference and self-centeredness that comes with huge grief, all while fantastically building world and tone. This is a really strong opening, and Jeffrey O'Harlem's fantastic writing doesn't really falter. The story really finds its footing when Arno meets Leon, who is a really great foil. Following Elisa's death, Arno is incredibly cynical, and his duty tasks him with helping this boy who is relentlessly idealistic. Leon is repeatedly challenging that pessimism, and the way that relationship builds is genuinely very sweet. I I really like Arno in this, and on paper that relationship sounds very saccharine and dishonest about grief and cynicism, but both characters are written really organically. Arno as a mopey misanthrope, and Leon as an idealistic child, with all of the aspirations of heroism and justice that you do kinda have when you're a ten-year-old boy, in his case ramped up by abandonment. He really is written very convincingly as a smart, ahead of his years child, rather than falling into the old trap of just writing, you know, a stunted adult. And after meeting Leon, that momentum doesn't really die down. Through Leon, there is genuine motivation to reclaim Arno's lost sense of duty. And another layer there is that you do feel some affinity for Franciard itself through the side content. The stories of Franciard and the murder mysteries, but mainly the stories because the murder mysteries here kind of blow the mystery element. And that's really one of the few issues with Dead Kings that does come to mind, that the murder mysteries fall kind of flat. I haven't played through the main game in, 
I mean, a good few years at this point, but I remember them being so much stronger than these two. But the Franciard stories are quite good at giving the city a sense of character and mystery. The city itself is pretty good. Much like the Holy Land, Franciard always feels oppressive and cold, making you opt for the rooftops which were clearly designed with parkour in mind. Generally, it does feel like Yubi Montpellier really wanted to create a deep, true to character Assassin's Creed experience, which is no clearer than it is in the dark depths of the caves, which serve up these really unique stealth encounters that play into the Assassins being these ghostly deathbringers, sowing paranoia into the hearts of their enemies. I'd completely forgotten about the leader mechanic, which basically allows for you to kill one stronger enemy, making all of his underlings in the area disperse. And although simple and a mechanic I'm certain isn't completely original, it really does open up some interesting stealth opportunities. A tactic I kept coming back to was sniping a leader, getting his subordinates to hide and cluster, and then blowing them up with the guillotine gun, which was a weapon that I didn't really have any love for previously. I saw this as something loud and abrasive and pointless to an assassin, but picking Dead Kings up again five years after my last replay, it's clearly, and kind of strangely, a useful stealth tool for dispersing enemies and taking them out in groups, using it in tandem with the leader mechanic. Another weapon, or tool in Dead Kings is of course the Apple of Eden, which in conjunction with the head of Saint-Denis, Arno uses to conjure up illusions of bats, scaring the raiders literally to death as Chris Velasco's gorgeous soundtrack escalates to this angelic, victorious peak. I mean everything, those new mechanics, the fantastic soundtrack, offhand NPC lines, the level, outfit and weapon design all feed back into the assassin being effectively a myth. This invisible executioner enacting murderous justice with a terrifying efficacy, just like the older games did. Mainly AC 1 and 2, which had their respective protagonists grow into these kind of oligarchal folk legends. To the Templars, Ezio wasn't Ezio. He was the assassin. One domino would fall and the next would shake. And while this just sounds like basic consequence, that element of myth and hysteria was the assassin fantasy reflected in story. When Jumaier installs decoys and Sibrant becomes psychotically paranoid, I feel like the covert agent of truth that the core gameplay tells me I am. This might seem tangential and insignificant, but it really does strengthen that fantasy, that unique assassin feel that Yubi Montpellier clearly prioritised here. I know that they're a little on the smaller side by Ubisoft standards, but I really hope, someday, that Yubi Montpellier get a shot, leading development on a mainline AC game. It's abundantly clear that interesting stealth specifically was paramount during the development of this DLC, and that's something I really do appreciate. Granted, I did have some issues with Unity's broken detection system and input lag, but again, I'm judging the contents of the expansion and not issues carried over by the main game. It wouldn't really be fair otherwise. In terms of actual negatives that you can pin on the DLC, I think the three puzzles here are fairly poorly designed. The interact prompts work maybe half the time, and there's more fixed camera angles that really throw you off unnecessarily. And really the shoddy puzzles and lacking murder mysteries are about the extent of my issues with Dead Kings. Rose ends up being a forgettable antagonist, but I don't think this is a story that particularly suffers for that. It's not like a, a Flavius situation where a big thematic conclusion is impaired for the antagonist being a nothing character and the whole game suffers. Arno's development here is unimpeded by Rose's genericness, and him being a completely unsympathetic bastard is weaved into a point, with Napoleon talking about how people like him, who are completely detached from any kind of moral compass, are very useful when controlled. It's Napoleon who really is the main adversary, even though he has less screen time than Rose, who is just one of his pawns, because Napoleon is unstoppable and driven, and he has huge support, all things that Arno lacks. Although there isn't any kind of personal rivalry there, Napoleon has no idea Arno is even in Frassiad. He is this relentless force suited to such a story. He's a sobering threat worth stepping up against. And I really like how this version of Napoleon is written. Although only a few years have passed, he's embraced the cynicism and the misanthropy that, arguably, got him so far. And I would say that the cast of this one is 
pretty tight. It's a lovely, small group of characters that accommodate a very short story that never stretches thin. The Raiders, too, as an enemy faction, I do really like. Behaviorally, they are quite distinct to the other two factions in Unity. My sole issue with them is the rocks. Their projectiles have literally no warning time on them, and I like that the way they fight reflects their shittiness, but giving you no indicator whatsoever doesn't feel fair or in line with the flow of combat the game has taught you. A shortened indicator would be cool, but having none kinda sucks. Besides that though, they are quite fun. They're weak and rely on their numbers. They'll cheer on a fight and then turn tail and beg for mercy when you end up killing the biggest baddest one. They're, they're such fucking scumbags, I love them. And if it's not clear already, I love Dead Kings as a whole. I only wish the main game was this good, because then I could do Unity as underrated videos and occupy that space in the Forbes list between Warren Buffett and White Light. Dead Kings is what I wish Jack the Ripper was. This almost redemptive expansion that alleviates some of the most unfortunate shortcomings of its main game. I don't think this is a Ballad of Gay Tony or a Blood and Wine. Ubisoft have never really facilitated that kind of inventiveness or scope in their expansions, but this is the Assassin's Creed DLC model perfected, or at least the closest we've come to perfection. In two hours, Dead Kings builds fantastically on Arno making him 10 times as compelling as he was in the main game, with a tenth of the time to do it. And there's a sense of harmony no other expansion in this series has achieved to such a level. The deteriorating beauty of the architecture that's accompanied by mournful strings and organs, the fogginess and grit of this world, its stories, its inhabitants, the tone is exceptionally crafted, and it all speaks to a morose, detached Arno. There's almost a purgatory-like quality to this one, at least all the way up until Arno rediscovers his purpose and dons his classic assassin robes once more, and then some vibrance is introduced. And there's also a sense of connection that Arno has with Napoleon, who, like I said earlier, is a total misanthrope who seems to exhibit basically the same worldview as Arno. But unlike Arno, who grows and eventually does open back up, Napoleon remains guarded and cynical. He fails and is arrested while Arno is restored, literally walking off into the sunset. I really love this one, and I could go on and on, and I kind of am, so we'll call it there. I'm sorry this has taken as long as it has, it should have been like three or four weeks, that's on me. I've realised that I hate these big gaps, and I want to have more than five or six videos out in one year. So while I do have a lot of big videos planned, like a massive AC3 critique, uh, an Ezio video in the same vein as the Altair one, that look back at Valhalla, I think I'm going to try and have a smaller 10-minute-ish video out at least every two weeks, and that might be, that might be how I actually cover Mirage. But anyway, I've kind of just gone from one ramble to the next. I do this every fucking video. I, I apologize. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, maybe leave a like. And if you didn't, maybe let me know why. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time.